sort of a lot of people, we we talk about product indifference and the efficient market hypothesis, and that you shouldn't you should believe the current prices. You shouldn't really trust your directional assumptions too much, and and, and you know you don't really pay attention to fundamentals. And people get this feeling of like, okay, but then what is there left to trade off of? Am I just out here doing nothing? Um, right? How do I make any decision? And so I wanted to go over today sort of what remains to be like paid attention to, even if you take the efficient market hypothesis fully seriously and arrive at like a complete product indifference and, you know, have attained your Buddha-like state where all where all underlyings are, are created equal. Um, they're still not exactly the same. There are meaningful distinctions between them. And I wanted to go over today sort of like what those sorts of things look like. All right, let's do it. Very cool. Right, so if a non-trader hears product indifference, right, you they come up with something that's a lot like oh so you guys are just you know monkeys tossing darts at a dartboard or here i have a quote from from burton malkiel he's the the author of a random walk down wall street uh, he's at he's at princeton he's a pretty big pretty big deal um and he says you know a blindfolded monkey throwing darts at the newspaper's financial pages could select a portfolio that would do just as well as one carefully selected by experts and i think this is often a tasty sort of our, our one of our main points is to not let experts pick your pick your stuff for you because they're not really doing much better than you would and in a lot of ways, this really ties very deeply into the efficient market hypothesis because the efficient market hypothesis says that the expected future value of any of any asset is its current value adjusted by the risk-free rate, right? Then there's no variation around that. So there's not really a reason to care about one thing versus another. So, right, we don't have directional assumptions and we don't care about fundamentals. So, so let's get into what is there left to pay attention to so that we can be a little bit better than a monkey tossing darts. Uh, yeah, so let's 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 think. I'm going to break it down to sort of three main things that one might want to pay attention to, even if one is really fully efficient market hypothesis pilled and all, all on board with product indifference. So let's look at those three. And the, the first one is liquidity, right? And this is sort of probably the most this is the most objective of them, right? This is one you, we can have some very numeric measurements about how liquid a market is and come up with like, is this a good trading vehicle or not, right? And the sort of the three things to ask yourself about a liquid market are how tight is it. How deep is it, and how broad is it? Or you know, tightness, depth, and breadth. Uh, tightness is you know usually visible in the bid ask spread. I've made a point in a skinny a while ago that I I think the bid ask ratio, like dividing uh, the the ask by the bid, is a little bit more meaningful than subtracting the bid from the ask, just because it adjusts for product size. Um, if you do that way, um, right? How many percent bigger? How many percent difference are they rather than you know dollars and cents? Mm -hmm. um, but either way, the 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 key thing idea is just that, you know. The, the spread, the difference between the bid and the ask sort of tells you how much you expect to lose if you want to enter and exit positions rapidly, which is, you know, a, 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 an attractive thing to be able to do. There is one bit here where there can be a little bit of deceit in, in how the sheets look, because some underlyings have large looking spreads, but if you know about them, you, you know that you'll still get filled near mid price, even though the, the bid and the ask look like they've got a, a decent amount of distance between them and that requires some experience and you know watching the network and seeing which underlyings are are popular those tend to be better ones for uh finding the things you can also get a, a reasonable judge of that by looking at the depth mm -hmm. um, right which is sort of how many trades how much action is going on in this underlying right and there you got there are sort of two main metrics to sort of judge that with and they're the volume and the open interest right so the volume is how many tra contracts have traded and the open interest is how many bids and asks are out there waiting to be traded and both of those give you a nice idea about sort of how much you can expect out of this underlying um in terms of availability and then the last one doesn't apply if you're just doing stocks but does apply in derivatives markets like options um which is breadth which is right this tightness and depth is a you know per uh question yeah and in, an, in an options market you can move away from the spot price and see do you maintain tightness and depth Right, as you get into further out of the money options or further out of the money futures, um, and right, and all of these together make for a nice liquid market, right? So this is something that can be sort of an objective, right? Liquid markets are better than illiquid markets. This is not a you know find your poison, pick what's best for you. This is a evaluate, try to stick to good ones, avoid bad ones. Nicely objective. This is something you pay attention to, no matter how product and different you are. Some are still better than others, not for fundamental reasons, but for liquidity. After liquidity, we get into sort of more preferential things to judge off of, right? So the volatility surface does not violate the efficient market hypothesis and does give a tremendous amount of information about sort of 
what the market expects out of an underlying. Um, so right at the volatility surface is looking at the IV and at seeing how the IV changes, um, the out of the money IV, looking at how the out of the money IV changes as you move between different strikes or between different expirations. And what this does really is it sort of takes geometric grounding motion as your baseline, um, as your, you know, we don't actually think underlines behave like this because we know, right, because there is a volatility smile and skew, um, right? That's evidence that they don't, that the market doesn't think that they work like this, but it provides like, the the frame the thing to which we will view as our baseline and then view variations from there rather than trying to describe in full what the underlying is expected to do we can say how it's how its expectations vary around a, like a brownian motion baseline um yeah. i think that make it a lot simpler right in a similar way to if you're on a plane and you want to tell the person you're flying with that you're going to the to the restroom you, you would say, I'm going to the restroom and use the planes frame of reference as your frame of reference and not, oh, I'm going to, you know, the spot over Indiana where the restroom happens to be right now, um, right? Which is what you would be doing if you were sort of trying to talk about the underlying in its own terms, right? You By by pinning yourself as a nice geometric brain motion as your frame of reference, everything gets a lot simpler to discuss. Well, in... Um, and Jacob, just to add very quickly, the Brownian motion, one of the things that's appealing is it is computationally very efficient. It's an easy formula, and it only requires a couple of parameters. When you start to try to describe the market more, um, when you try to describe it better, as you know, that we've talked about, you add a lot more parameters that are not always evident. So yes, it is Brownian motion is not a perfect descriptor of stock price behavior. But as you point out, it's a good baseline to judge everything else. Right. And by looking at the applied volatility surface, we can sort of get a, a really clear picture of how the market says that it expects this to differ from a Brownian motion. Mm -hmm. right? If it, right. If it had a perfectly flat volatility surface, that would say the market thinks this is going to behave like a Brownian motion. And since it doesn't, the market is saying it doesn't, but it can be relatively clear about how that is, right? As the volatilities go up fast, as you move away from the spot price, that means the market is pricing in larger motions more 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 aggressively than than a brownie motion, right? If it doesn't go down up that fast, it's it's less so, right? If it's got negative skew, that says that the market is expecting is expecting small upward motions, but is prepared for a, a probability of a large downward motion. Uh -huh. That's that's how it interprets skew. The, the the problem here is that the unlike liquidity, this doesn't have the same. You know, this market is better than this market. This just gets you a what you expect out of this underlying, right? Why is test? How is Tesla going to be different from right? In, in sort of how they're going to behave, and you can see that in their volatility surface. And then which one is good for you to be trading in depends on where you want any of your investment goals. Um, to to call back to when we did uh, modern portfolio theory, this is called the Markowitz efficient frontier, right? Mm -hmm. As you sort of decide where you want to be in the amount of risk to expected payoff trade-offs that you have to make when you're making your decisions. And then I've got one question, uh, homework question for, for people at home. They can send me an email if they think they figured it out, which is, right, the volatility surface is formed by looking at the out-of-the-money IVs only. But if you look at your option sheet, you've got in-the-money IVs across the way, right? You've got puts, you've got calls, and they don't always fully line up. So what additional information, if any, can you get by also considering the in-the-money IVs and how those change away from the spot price? It's a, it's an interesting question to think about. We don't have time for it today, but I thought people at home might might want to ponder it for a bit. Yeah, I like that you bring up the the efficient frontier that I think is kind of interesting. When I first learned about it thirty plus years ago, it was standard, you know, best, you know, portfolio stocks, bonds, real estate, all that crap. No one ever thought about options, and so if you think about a por various portfolios of options based on volatility and, as you point out, liquidity, it would be interesting to see where how that would define that curve of the potential you know that 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 um that curve of returns of portfolios upon which you could draw that that optimal tangent line right well right it's always going to be tangent to the risk-free rate line and right. then right but how the curve meets it is going to yeah depend on what products we have available for the discussion right and we certainly have a lot more products nowadays than we did when, when you were a child. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you want to pay attention to the volatility surface. It has a lot of information in it. It doesn't have strict this is better than that information in the same way liquidity does, but it does have a lot of information to it that you can try to interpret. And then the last thing that I wanted to sort of bring up to people that they, you can pay attention to are correlations, um, right? Which is, this is where 
a lot of when, when people have, you know, their, their sort of intuitive understanding about the market, they've heard news, right? Boeing is having, you know, it, it got a new CEO and had a whole, you know, uh, and it is, but is also still undergoing a whole crisis of management, right? And does this matter for other airline companies or Boeing, right? If it's a Boeing, does it apply to Lockheed Martin, right? Other manufacturers. This is where you can get a lot of mileage out of your sort of understanding of, of businesses and their fundamentals. This is where that can influence things even through the efficient market hypothesis. But it's important to be careful about what sort of conclusions you're drawing. Um, because it's very tempting to say, oh, these things are highly correlated and this one just went up. So maybe I want to go to then come away with a directional assumption on the other one, right? To come up with wanting to be long or short it because you think it's going to reverse or continue. And that's not what correlations have for you, right? Correlations are, are, are a simultaneous effect. So they don't tell you that because X went up, you expect Y2 then also go up, right? There's no then in a correlation. Mm -hmm. It's it's all simultaneous that they do it together or apart. And so you don't get to like look at one and then use that to inform what you do in the other. What instead would let you do is sort of try to control your risk or compound it by either using them as hedges against each other or tying them into each other. And in general, the, the thing to remember is that if you find low correlations and then do smaller trades in both of the lower correlation underlines, that's going to be a way to reduce your total variance without really giving up a lot else. And it's important that you do smaller trades though, right? If you just make a, one lot in one thing and one lot in another unrelated underline, that's still more risky than any one lot on its own. But if you did half in each, that is going to, you know, give you a square to two factor reduction in your volatility, which is right. in your portfolio variance. And therefore um, increases your risk adjusted return. That's, that's right. the objective. Right. The, right. the objective is to, to, to get, to, to get your returns without minimizing your risk, right? That's the efficient frontier we were just talking about. That's just all right. Correlations give a lot of space for you to use your, your knowledge of markets and businesses and these things, but you need to be careful about what kinds of conclusions you draw from them. Cause it's very easy to come up way with them with directional assumptions, which are what are sort of ruled out by the efficient market hypothesis, instead of volatility correlative assumptions, which give you, let you set up nice pairs trades and things like that, but don't give you, you know, sure things or directional biases. And that's it. That's all I want to talk about today. Those are, those are the three things I could come up with. That's that good. Stand yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, um, yeah. And Jacob, just to, and I, you know, before you do the recap and you'll cover all this, I'm sure, but a lot of people, we are, what we do here is fighting against a massive industry that says we're wrong. In other words, that there is value in evaluating stocks and listening to analysts and doing all this stuff. And they say, well, oh, you know, your product indifferent, meaning we are monkeys throwing darts at a dartboard, right? They don't take the time to learn exactly what you laid out here. That's, that's the di difference. And we are unfortunately, or for the benefit of Tasty Traders, a small voice in this huge industry that's saying otherwise. Yeah, I think it's, it's perhaps reasonable to compare it to uh, seances and spiritualists who want to talk to your <laughs> dead relatives, right? <laughs> like, they can make up a lot of stuff about what they think your dead relative says, but actually, if you just went and, like, looked through your rel like look through your dead relatives home you might find more meaningful information about them <laughs> even if it's a little bit less satisfying less tempting right it's a little bit less persuasive but it is more solid uh being product indifferent can sound like being an ignorant trader however taking the efficient market process seriously still leaves us with things to focus on for picking our trades we can pay attention to liquid markets appealing volatility surfaces and the inter underlying correlations um, and then I have up here is one last caveat as we, you know, internalize our product indifference and start wanting to trade a wider range of products. If you move away from sort of standardized options and start doing into futures or commodities, you do need to be mindful that some of these have different contract sizes and tick sizes. And so not everything that you know fully translates over. Um, it does, right? There's just, it's just changing units, but you do need to be careful of that when you start getting really, really expanding out the number of products that you want to trade in. Um, some of them have just little differences in the technicalities behind them that yeah. you know aren't meaningful, yeah. but they do matter for like how you actually place an order. Um, we we call it nuanced know-how. Nuanced yeah. know-how. Yeah, it's nuanced. We we yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a lot of this stuff in my webinar today. Same not same presentation, but a lot of the from liquid markets to appealing volatility situations opportunities. We like to say mm -hmm. to um, inter underlying correlations. And then how to manage those positions once you get them on because that's you know there's two challenges here one is putting the positions on and then one is managing the positions once you have them on 